everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis. I am a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Renny Vandeweg. He's a Forbes contributor and general manager of weather and climate intelligence at DTN. Renny, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. This week marks the 20th anniversary since Hurricane Katrina made landfall, and it was one of the most catastrophic storms in American history. The storm resulted in over 1,800 deaths, over $120 billion worth of damage, and the disaster on the ground was really only exacerbated by engineering failures as well as failures from the government's response. So when Katrina hit, though, you had just started your career as a meteorologist. You were in your early 20s. You were less than two months on the job, and you see just this this killer storm coming your way. So to start the conversation off, bring us back to 20 years ago. Talk to us about tracking Katrina from the Bahamas originally, and then when it ultimately made landfall at the Louisiana-Mississippi border. Yeah, we had great insights. So I was located in Meridian, Mississippi, which is about 120 miles north of, uh, say, Gulf Shores, Alabama, Biloxi, Mississippi. And we had a very good idea that this was going to be a powerful storm. Um, when you're in your early 20s as a meteorologist, you get excited by the power of meteorology. And so truth be told at the time, and I was so young into my career, I was there's a there's a level of excitement to see this storm brewing in the ocean. But as it started to make landfall and as you start to interact with the community that you're serving, you realize it's it's a lot of fear and unknown. At that time, we were really focused on uh, trying to communicate in a way that people realize that this was not just a normal hurricane, that this truly had power behind it. And as a result, uh, we had to change our communication techniques throughout to not just say, here we are crying wolf, here's hype behind a storm. This is the real deal. Uh, that was a lasting impression that I had was once we recognized this major storm was going to impact New Orleans, the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and quite frankly, really far inland in Mississippi, we had to change the way we talked about it. And you bring up a conversation you had with a woman who came up to you in a bar a few days before the storm. She essentially asked you, how bad is this going to be or something to that effect? And you had a really blunt response. And from reading your piece, it looks like that response saved her life because you could have went into the science, right? You could have went into the numbers. But what you said, I think, changed her opinion. Talk to us about that conversation. Yeah, it was, uh, we worked a lot of hours during that event. This was two days before landfall eventually occurred and went out and had a drink and, and was just trying to kind of unwind myself. And a, a very nice lady came up to me and said, hey, I've been watching you on TV. Is this really as bad as you say it's going to be? And I said, well, yeah, yes, this is a really, this is a category five storm in the Gulf of Mexico at the time. It was category three at landfall. But she said, my family is, lives right on the Gulf Coast, and they survived Hurricane Camille in the 1970s. And uh, they feel like they're fine from this storm. And the way to get it across, the words I used directly to her were, do you want to see your family again? And she paused. The look on her face, I'll never forget 20 years later, and said, well, of course I do. And I said, you need to call them and tell them to come visit you here in Meridian. And um, you leave that conversation, you work the event, and you see everything that unfolds. And I just, I, I guess coincidentally or maybe not, got to actually see her again uh, at a different place uh, about four months later. And she came up to me and hugged me and said, thank you. They left the coast. And when they went back home, they were left with just a slab. And I think that really goes to show how your communication can really save lives. And I'm curious if you think the category makes much of a difference here because it was category five initially, but then when it got on, to, when it made landfall, it made landfall as a cat three storm. Do you think that the category tells the whole story of a storm? We're finding that so categories are directly tied to just the wind rating, and, th and that's a fair way to look at the strength of a storm, but we know that there is more impact. You can look at Hurricane Helene just a couple years ago in North Carolina. North Carolina, in the mountains, not near the ocean, was a catastrophic storm because of flooding. And so the threats that occur from hurricanes are not just tied to the wind, uh, it can be tied to rainfall. It can be tied to flooding. In Katrina's case, it was an engineering challenge in New Orleans. And so 
I do believe that when you go from a category four storm to a, or a category five storm to a category three, you will see a lot of people breathe a sigh of relief. That can be um, uh, an inaccurate way to react to such news because in this case, this storm was building up a pile of water that made the storm surge such an impact. And the way that that storm surge funneled, funneled into Lake Pontchartrain is what ultimately created the problems in New Orleans. And so uh, the way that we describe storm needs to be more focused on impact than just a number. And so I think over time in the meteorological community and in this ecosystem that DTN is a part of and the broadcasters are part of the National Weather Service, we've really honed in on how you communicate impact and risk beyond just giving it a simple number. The, the number is an easy to understand. Well, if it's a five, it's really bad. And if it's a one, it's not as bad. But the true story is actually in those individual impacts that occur and how they interact with uh, the landscape. And I think you were spot on in conveying just how devastating, just how catastrophic this storm is going to be, right? Because like you said, you said to someone, do you want to see your family again? And that gets the point across. Looking throughout the past 20 years, I'm curious how you've seen forecasting change overall since Katrina to now. Well, it's we become much more precise in terms of understanding. So the weather models that we use today, there's so much data that comes out of that, that we can see probability of occurrence occurring within these different impacts. And, and you, you almost have so much data that you really need to focus in on how you communicate that. And so I think over time, we've um, the, the forecasting has become more accurate. At the same time, I'm seeing more and more occurrence of better communication styles and better methodology to get that, whether that be via mobile apps, via weather radio, via television, social media. At times, however, we're also seeing the influx of social media providing false information or information that isn't as accurate. And so uh, it's a balance that we in the meteorological community have to strike and choose when and how we communicate this information going forward. So weather forecasting has become better, but I truly believe the communication of risk is the top set of information that we can provide so that anybody making a decision, whether it's a business or a personal safety decision, the way you communicate that is going to determine how somebody decides and that decision is the critical factor at the end of the day. I think as a journalist, I can remember, and all the journalists I know can remember their first big story they covered, right? Because they could immediately understand just the gravity of the situation, the gravity of the story. And it really impacts how you look at your job and how you how you look at storytelling for the rest of your career. And I can only imagine, I'm sure that's how you feel about Katrina, right? As a meteorologist. And I'm sure that shaped your entire career. How did it shape your career, A? And what lessons did you learn from covering that storm? Well, there's a lot, to be honest with you. I'll pick a couple. First off, it should be noted that I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's where I live today. Uh, we thought oceans were just fiction, right? Uh, right in the middle of the heartland. And so uh, to be six weeks into a career in forecasting a hurricane, I learned a lot about the meteorology and impacts of hurricanes from that storm. And I, I think that's become foundational to me in learning a different type of science as opposed to tornadoes or winter storms. But what really impacted me, Brittany, as is, is I went through this storm was the impact on people and I think that's what shaped me throughout my entire career was not just the lead up to the event and the communication, but seeing the aftermath of that storm. It, it makes me emotional to this day, remembering some of the stories that occurred after Katrina, the stories the, uh, from New Orleans and from the Superdome and people moving to Baton Rouge or Houston. But in Meridian, we had a lot of residents of Houston, or I'm sorry, of New Orleans that ended up in Meridian just trying to flee, and they had never left the city in their entire life. They didn't know where they were. It was really impactful to hear from, from people that had their entire lives disrupted. They were so comfortable in the city of New Orleans, and here they were trying to navigate through Meridian, Mississippi, and I talked to them individually. And so uh, it becomes far less about the weather part of the story, and it became very much about the people part of the story humans helping humans, humans communicating to humans. 
And I think in weather risk and forecasting going forward, we really tried to put the human first and in the impact first and less about being the smartest scientist in the room. It's way more about taking that love, passion, and knowledge of the science, understanding it impacts people's lives or businesses, and being able to communicate going forward. And so that that's the lesson that I really learned from this was, yes, there are scientific learnings and technology learnings we had. It is 100% the communication with individuals and letting them make decisions to protect their life, protect their families and their property. And some of the neighborhoods, some of the communities are still feeling those impacts from Hurricane Katrina 20 years later. I have friends who grew up in Louisiana, and just by talking to them, you can tell how much this has fundamentally shaped people's lives, changed people's lives, impacted childhoods, impacted entire families. You can still see that and hear that today and hear those stories 20 years later. And I know you said that science has come so far. We've learned so much from Hurricane Katrina, but you're a little concerned about the misinformation out there. Looking back as we reflect on this 20 year anniversary, I mean, where do you think we can make some changes? I think it comes down to uh, continuing to find the right people to trust with information. And um, this is not just true of weather. I think it's true of anything that we look into. There's got to be a trusted source of information and make sure that uh, the reason behind you're receiving something is has the right heart behind it. And so um, I think as we continue to evolve, there are still reminders that we're not perfect at this. The flooding in Texas recently at the camps is an indicator to us that we still have more to do in communication, planning, and action that reduces weather risk. And so as we see a change in climate, we see more impactful weather, it's, this isn't slowing down. And so as a community and a meteorological community, we need to continue providing very relevant information that is focused on taking decision and action that keeps people safe. And I think if you're a consumer of this information, ensuring you're getting that from the right source uh, that is focused on you and the decision you're making is really, really important. You recently caught up with one of the meteorologists who you were covering Katrina with, and he posed a question to you that has stuck with you. And the question was, if Katrina happened again tomorrow, what would the outcome be? What, it's a beautiful day here in New York. It's a beautiful sunny day, but I'm just imagining what it was like 20 years ago today. What do you think the answer is to that question? It's uh, it's one I hope we don't actually face the answer to. However, um, it is a great question. What I think would happen is my hope is that we would dramatically reduce the number of deaths that occurred. That number uh, that you cited at the beginning sticks out to me and I will tell you that there have been a few events in my career when I did work in television where people die in your viewing area and you take that personally. It's probably not fair to do, but you do. You take that personally. And so when you when you see numbers in the thousands uh, of deaths from a storm, my hope is that our communication methods and science would really reduce that total going forward. However, uh, I don't know that you can actually just stop the impact of storms from creating damage. And so the outcomes that occur we, we have property and uh, cities that sit in the pathway of these storms. I think it would still be a very damaging storm, but I would hope the people impact would be dramatically less because we've learned so much over time. Ronnie Vandeweg, I appreciate your reflections. I appreciate your perspective here. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope we can have another conversation soon. Thank you, Brittany.